My decided theme for NAB this year was magical realism. Um, the theme that NAB chose was storytelling, that every story starts here. And I have this slide just to tell you that I love a lot of things because I'm going to say some stuff and people are going to say, oh, Mark hates HDTV, or Mark hates VR, zoom lenses, whatever. Um, here's an example of the magic and the reality. Here's another example of the magic and the reality. Um, not quite sure what that thing on the left is, some sort of camera mounting unicorn. And uh, the reality was black magic, which did not introduce anything earth shattering this year, but introduced improvements to everything in their line, as they do every year. Uh, attendance this year, um, it's down significantly, especially from 2017. I have the unaudited figures on the left there, and even the number of companies exhibiting is down significantly, and even from last year. The magic part is, well, if it's down, we don't want it to be that down, so we'll use the unaudited figure for 2019 and the audited figure for 2018 in the press release. Uh, and we'll throw in this line that so many people self-identified as buyers. There were more people who self-identified as buyers. How many people here were at NAB? Did anyone ask you to self-identify as a buyer? I didn't think so. Um, this was from Pro Video Coalition, random thoughts on my saddest NAB ever. And part of that article uh, references that tweet on the upper left. Uh, boy, I remember the old days when Apple Red and DJI used to exhibit. Facebook, however, had a very large exhibit. I think the main purpose of it was so that you could stand in front of the wall and make a thumbs up sign. Um, the show opened with Gordon Smith, the president of NAB, doing the keynote, and part of his keynote was this sentence, the next-gen TV attachment with this phone lets me watch my favorite stations anywhere I am. Wow. Uh, and he also said that Apple is refusing to add broadcast chips to its products. Well, I showed you this slide last year, differences between ATSC 1.0 and ATSC 3.0. Uh, so next to the last line, it's in red now. Um, for ATSC 1.0, the government mandated reception in TVs. For ATSC 3.0, there is no mandate. And the TV set manufacturers have not put putting in receivers because there isn't any content to receive. So one of the exciting things about ATSC 3.0 at NAB was uh, two coalitions of broadcasters coming together and saying, by uh, the end of 2020, we'll have ATSC 3.0 in 40 markets. Um, how much ATSC 3.0, we don't know. What quality ATSC 3.0, we don't know. But there will at least be something, so there may be TV sets. So back to that sentence in the keynote, he says, this attachment lets me watch my favorite stations anywhere I am. Well, did it let him watch Washington TV stations in Las Vegas? No, there are plenty of devices that will do that, but a next-gen receiver is not one. Uh, he also said, this next-gen TV attachment allows me to watch my favorite stations anywhere I am. So we've made it back to 1962 technology. Uh, here was uh, something in TV technology that NAB announces the successful ATSC 3.0 transmission of Nielsen's audience measurement technology. And then the article goes on to talk about how the audience measurement technology is actually something in the audio signal. So you should all be very pleased to know that ATSC 3.0 can carry audio. <laughs> um, now, we're already trying to cram multiple stations into single ATSC 3.0 channels, but here's ETRI of Korea, and they are bonding multiple ATSC 3.0 channels now so that they can get enough bandwidth to do 8K. Um, 8K is supposed to look better than HD, 
and maybe under some conditions it does. This was a 3D display showing how bad pictures could get at the show. <laughs> um, there was very little 3D or augmented reality or mixed reality or virtual reality at the show. This is an RCA TK45 tube television camera and it was producing some of the best pictures I saw at the show. <laughs> Here is Andy Sitos. Some of you may remember him from WNET or Warner Amex or MTV Networks. Um, he's wearing his special glass glasses because he wants to make sure he does get all the resolution that is available. And what does he see coming after 4K and 8K? Special K. <laughs> uh, here's the chair of the UHD Alliance. The UHD Alliance UHD stands for ultra high definition, supposedly is there to uh, promote ultra high definition, but here he's saying, well, you know, UHD doesn't really necessarily mean ultra high definition, it could mean high dynamic range or something, and by the way, high dynamic range gives you an awful lot more than uh, ultra high definition. So, um, there's also interactions, these have appeared in the SIMTI journal, um, this is one of the student papers from Rochester Institute of Technology. I love going to their student paper sessions and seeing what they have. So here they're talking about judder sensitivity in cinema exhibition when you go to HDR. So 24 frames per second may not be enough if you're doing HDR. Um, speaking of cinema screens, here is something in the Hollywood Reporter, NAB trends that mattered this year, and one is the spotlight dims on LED cinema screens. Direct view cinema screens was going to be a big thing. There was at least one at the show, uh, Sony's, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but why is the, whoops, why is the light dimming on it? Well, here is Sony's LED cinema screen. It's absolutely fantastic. You can see it on the right there, and you see an illuminated sign uh, talking about Sony. So that's when the screen is bright. Here's when the screen is dark. Uh, no, that's not a picture that you're seeing on there. That's reflection of things in the Sony booth. And you can see the Sony sign reflected in the screen. So if you have an exit light in the movie theater, you get a big reflection on the screen when things are dark. Uh, something that may be able to be worked out, but at the moment it's still a problem. More of the uh, RIT student papers. Uh, an investigation of the value of wide color gamut. We all say, wow, wide color gamut, absolutely fantastic. Well, what's it actually worth? What do viewers actually care? That's something they're looking into. Here's another one, determining a consumer preference for motion blur, whether people actually want to see blurry pictures rather than sharp pictures in motion. Um, the Immersive Digital Experience Alliance was yet another alliance that was at NAB and uh, people are saying there's an urge to immersion or an urge to immerse. Here is more ATSC 3.0 news. The US is proposing ATSC 3.0 as a digital standard, an international broadcast standard, an international digital broadcast standard. Uh, Woohoo! But so were NTSEM, so was Brazil's PAL-M. It's not a big deal to be an international standard. You just propose it, they rubber stamp it, and you're an international standard. Doesn't mean anybody's going to use it. SIMTI standards, that's different. And uh, here we have one last thing on ATSC 3.0, riding the road. Um, this is so while you're driving, you can watch things in HD or 8K or something like that. Uh, but, speaking of cars, here's a story of a gamer who got um, accustomed to driving a race car while gaming and he actually had a real race in a real race car and beat a real race car driver. So e-games is significant and so there was quite a bit on e-sports and e-games uh, at NAB. And here's a story, the impact of multiplayer games on entertainment and cinema. Um, Three billion people are watching eSports of some sort. That's half the population of the Earth, basically. Um, so it's a significant platform. 
and it is eating into entertainment. But what else is eating into entertainment? Is esports the only thing that's eating into Netflix audiences? Well, no. Here's something that Netflix um, tweeted in the middle of Super Bowl. Uh, they said their streaming is down 32% versus the Super Bowl. So broadcast is still pretty strong in some areas. And streaming can also have some problems. Here's a YouTube thing. Whoops, we couldn't deliver what you wanted. Here is BBC iPlayer. Oh, sorry, that didn't work either. Um, here is Amazon Prime. Whoops, uh, drew fire for the live stuff. So live streaming of sports, still an issue, not quite taken care of yet. And according to Microsoft, the digital divide is much wider than we think. The FCC said, oh, everybody has access to broadband. And Microsoft said, no, it's only about 2% of people. The FCC has since revised down considerably. They haven't gotten down as low as Microsoft yet, but um, they have changed their mind. Now, here's another thing about the Super Bowl. This is latency up to the receiver, not even counting receiver latency. You can see it goes up to about uh, 45 seconds or something like that, a little bit more than 45 seconds. Um, who cares? You know, the Super Bowl starts at 1 or it starts at 1.00.45, who cares? Well, sports betting is now legal. And so betters care. And Wall Street has been going wireless in a bid for ultra low latency. The same kind of thing is going to happen with streaming. So here we have uh, Aronsoft, and they say they have ultra low latency encoders. Their definition of ultra low latency, by the way, is under a second. Um, but here is Limelight Networks, and they're demonstrating this impressive thing where we're looking at signals going from Las Vegas to Los Angeles and Paris and coming back. And at first glance, it looks like those two pictures are the same, but if you look at the um, guy second from the right, you can see his head has turned. Um, you can see some other differences in the pictures. So. Um, geographic distance is going to affect latency. The cloud, um, well, now we can have reliable injection to the cloud. Isn't that nice? The uh, most reliable source that people have been thinking of in the past was Zixi. And here's a wall of logos of all the people using Zixi stuff. And it is quite reliable but they're now getting some competition from the Secure Reliable Transport Open Source Alliance. And there were a few signs around the show of SRT, not as many as for Zixi yet. The Zixi people say, yes, you know, we know SRT is doing this stuff, but we think we're better. Um, Dante is another alliance, and that was all over the show. I don't think there was an audio company at NAB that didn't have the Dante spoken here. Um, and I like the sign saying, now with AES 67. There's Dante's wall of people who are using the Dante system. Some other um, alliances, there was SMPTE ST2110, of course, but Nutex NDI still had a few people. The Origami ecosystem for hardware associated with IP video. Uh, you probably don't recognize most of those companies. And here is a truck from the mobile TV group. And you can see down at the bottom left there, uh, introducing end-to-end -end native IP mobile unit. And I have nothing bad to say about this truck. It's an excellent truck. Uh, but I'm going to show you some historical stuff. This is a pre-electric telephone office. And if you look at the left side of the picture, the left side of the desk, there are four acoustic speaking tubes. That's what people used before telephones. They would pick the thing up, hold it to their mouth, and say, hey, what is that thing in here? Um, so that's roughly turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century. Here is um, an older thing. This is an image from a book published in 1673, and it's describing an acoustic intercom in the 4th century BCE. So that's all ancient history, except this is 21st century US Navy photograph. And notice that the guy is speaking into a speaking tube. 
He's also wearing a headset with a microphone near his lips. He is also holding a uh, microphone in his hand, but he is speaking into the speaking tube. Well, why is that? Because on a Navy boat, it's mission critical. And if the electrical system goes down, you need some other way to communicate. So now we go back to that truck that I have nothing bad to say about because I asked them very tough questions. It's an end-to-end -end native IP truck, and it is. But it's got patch panels, even though IP doesn't use patch panels. The switcher has broadband inputs, meaning non-IP inputs. There is an analog audio mixer available. So if all else fails, the show stays on the air. You lose some capability, but uh, you stay on the air. And that's very important, which is why I love that truck. But you have to know 2110 is different from uh, existing stuff. You can't patch around a problem, at least not physically. You can do it virtually. Film at the show, uh, still going strong, quite a bit of film stuff. Notice that uh, film chain is a 10K film chain. Uh, this was at Sony. They're using artificial intelligence to extract handwriting. I'm not quite sure what the significant application for that one is. Um, but here's a better application of AI. Uh, this was at NAB. They said that the um, worst attacks of uh, security problems have been credential hacks um, for credentials for streaming services. And so Cinemedia is offering an AI solution to eliminate password sharing and maybe start attacking that problem. Velosa had another one. This relates to the New Zealand uh, mosque shooting. And they say they can very quickly identify uh, when guns are involved and get things taken down before thousands of sites start uh, publishing them. So two very good uses of AI, I think. Uh, 5G, a confusing mess. Um, testing 5G speeds, they're not necessarily any faster than 4G. Your battery life may vary down to zero. Uh, maybe your 5G isn't even 5G, it's just 4G. We don't yet know what the frequencies are that are going to be used and so on. But here is the head of our FCC speaking at the White House and he's talking about how important 5G is. And one of the reasons it's important is telemedicine. Okay, uh, I have a pain. <laughs> what does 5G have to do with telemedicine? You're, the doctor is going to operate on you from his car that's moving through a 5G zone. Um, and lest we think that 5G is the end, here we're starting to focus on 6G. Um, we hear a lot about cord cutting, but in fact, the vast majority of users of cable and satellite are staying on cable and satellite. And the last figure I saw, I think this week, was 86 million households in the United States are still connected to cable or satellite. Um, now, this Westminster Dog Show thing doesn't seem to have anything to do with NAB, uh, but I'm just pointing out that the Westminster Dog Show has one best in show. This is NAB. Um, they had a new award this year, the product of the year. There were 120 products of the year, uh, sometimes 20 of them in the same category. And uh, TV technology gave out 67 best of show, at least 67. That was the number of images in their gallery. Um, this looks like a, a good product. It's a cable cam for a lightweight camera. There's something like a, a GoPro down on the bottom of that. And let's see if I can get the video to start here. Whoops. Nope. Let's go back to that. Can you start the video on this one, Eric? Yeah, looks like a good idea, except it's doing that. <laughs> Uh, here's a tradition at NAB. Every year, Canon says we're coming out with the uh, greatest zoom range lens. And every year, by the time NAB rolls around, Fujinon ups them a little bit. So <laughs> Canon had a 122 by 8.2. Fujinon came up with a 125 by 8. This is the Ikigami UHD 430. And it had an interesting feature that I didn't notice anyplace else on the show floor, portrait extraction. 
So this is a 4K camera, meaning that within the middle of the picture, instead of having the 16 to 9 landscape, you can extract a 9 by 16 HD. And why would you care to do that? Well, it's because more screens are now vertical than horizontal. So that's the Columbus Circle uh, subway station on the left. That's Broadway and 70... Third Street or so on, in the middle. And on the right is a new TV from Samsung called the Cero, which you can use either in 16 to 9 or 9 to 16 mode. Um, satellites are starting to um, combine with fiber. And so we'll just provide you a service. And if it's good enough for us to do it on satellite, fine. If not, we'll deliver it on fiber. Um, Getting to real products, fabrics, uh, excellent audio video delay analysis built into their handheld stuff now. Uh, Sarnoff used to be famous for coming up with test signals that did not need an analyzer. And then people said, well, can't you make an analyzer? And so they did. And one of the things I like about this analyzer is it not only tells you what the signal is now, but what somebody might have done to it at some point in the past. So was it ever scaled to 1280? Was it ever scaled to 960? And the analyzer will show you that. Here's a new term for you, FLAP. This is what um, IBM is offering, flash plus tape. So the tape gives you archival, the flash gives you instant access. Tracking was a very big theme at NAB this year. And this is one of my favorites from uh, this company, SearVision. And I'm going to run a little bit of video now. And this is real time. They're picking up the knees and ankles and other nodal points of people just walking around the show floor. And they picked up some stuff on my head, which will combine them out. There I am going across the bottom. Um, and this is a company that uses tracking stuff for some of its stuff, Rushworks. Their new product this year is called VNews basically a news studio in a box. It starts at $16,000, it ends at about $26,000. You can have up to four cameras, graphics, switcher, uh, pan, tilt, zoom, lighting, it's all in the box. And this is my uh, pick of the show. This is the Azelpix camera. It's about the size of my fist, whoops. And um, it's got an 8K image sensor in it, and the lens shoots 360 degrees in one direction and 270 degrees in another direction. And it's got processing that will extract nine or even more images from that if you want, each of them an HD image. And you can pan, tilt, zoom, dutch the images if you want to. Um, you can control, uh, gain, black, gamma, anything you would normally control with a camera control unit. Um, not cheap for a point of view camera, but awfully cheap for uh, what it can do. And this was my favorite moving image technology at the show. That's actual water coming down with little valves so you can put pictures into the water as it falls. And uh, this is a lie. <laughs> Normally the PDF is available by the time I speak, but I was having some computer issues, so I'll try to get that out tonight. And thank you very much.